Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to invite uh, Russ Richens to come up. Um, there he is. I'd like to thank Russ. Russ and Tom Pittman, who's bustling around here, uh, are responsible for the recording equipment that, uh, that is functioning here, we hope. That wasn't even intended to be dramatic. <laughs> um, can you imagine what it would have been like for Emma to um, have to move something like this around all the time? Always covered up, never could see it. What would it be like for Josiah Stoll if, um, when being, as I understand, passed through a window, he was helping out, you caught just a little tiny glimpse of something in a bag. What about Catherine uh, Smith, who was 16? 14. What would it have been like for her to try to lift something? This little object here is, uh, I can't even say a replica because we don't know. But based on the best descriptions, this is a 40 pound object that will represent the gold plates in the film Witnesses. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a history or a little bit of uh, uh, update on Witnesses, we are, we start production uh, next month on September 3rd. And it has been uh, an interesting and rewarding and powerful journey as we move forward. These plates that we have here will be in the film uh, through the generous uh, support and help of Dave Baird, as, long as, as well as another set of plates. But imagine too, if you were Emma or you were um, Lucy Max Smith and you were hearing this, you could actually hear that, and yet you couldn't see them. Kind of an interesting experience. Anyway, Witnesses is moving forward. We'll be filming first in Upper Canada Village, which is actually in the southern part of Canada, on the St. Lawrence uh, River, over, uh, over the river from New York State. Then we'll be moving down to Old Sturbridge Village, which is in uh, Massachusetts, about an hour and a half out of Boston. And then we'll be coming back here to Utah and filming a number of days uh, here in the Utah area for a number of our interiors and things like that. Things are moving forward, it's exciting, and uh, we are pleased with what we're, we're doing, and we're very pleased with the interviews we've been able to get so far, looking at uh, at least one man that we've interviewed already who's here in the audience, Matt Roper, and there will be more interviews which we'll be doing. Uh, if you have questions afterwards, I'm happy to answer what I can. Thank you. Now we have a chance to hear um, from my friend Royal Skousen, who I think doesn't really need much introduction for most of you. He's responsible um, in, in a remarkable way for one of the most remarkable scholarly undertakings that the church has seen, uh, and certainly uh, a really important landmark project in connection with the Book of Mormon, that is the Critical Text Project on the Book of Mormon. He's going to speak to us a little bit about, um, about a couple of books that are forthcoming in that project, which has been ongoing now for about a quarter of a century, a little more, right? Uh, this weekend, I will be doing the final proofing for uh, part five of volume three of the critical text. It's called the uh, King James Bible in the Book of Mormon. And the next few weeks, I will be finishing up the proofing for part six of Volume 3, Spelling in the Manuscripts and Editions. Originally, I had planned to publish these two uh, parts in a single volume, but the amount of material that I discovered and have written up has required me to print each title in a separate volume. Um, each of them will be about 500 pages long. And I'm grateful for my donors who have been willing to allow me to um, 
have this extension and do in this project what I need to do. There will be ultimately eight parts in Volume 3 of the Critical Text. Volume 3 is called The History of the Text of the Book of Mormon. By this fall, I will have published the first six parts. By 2021, two years from now, all eight uh, will have been published at the rate of one book a year. Uh, parts one and two, grammatical variation, um, is uh, two parts, 1,281 pages, published in 2016. It lists all the grammatical editing that the Book of Mormon text has undergone, which is immense. But more important, it argues that all of the non-standard grammar in the original text of the Book of Mormon, the so-called bad grammar, should not be attributed to Joseph Smith, but rather it represents the normal usage of early modern English. The first example of this I discovered and uh, talked about at a public lecture at BYU in uh, March of 2013, In Them Days, which occurs in the text of the Book of Mormon twice in the original text. It turns out it's in academic scholarly writing from around the early 1600s. We've always been embarrassed by this bad grammar. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be. Next, the next year, in 2014, uh, Stanford Carmack uh, published a very important paper in The Interpreter. Um, it's also, I republished it in grammatical variation called The Nature of the Non-Standard English in the Book of Mormon. And he basically showed that all of the bad grammar was in scholarly academic writing in the 15 and 1600s. Um, parts three and four have also been published. It's called The Nature of the Original Language, published last year, 1,383 pages. This is about the language of the Book of Mormon, the original language, and the argument that I make with the help of uh, Stanford is that um, the language of the Book of Mormon can be based on and tied to uh, early modern English from the 1530s up through the 1730s with only a few exceptions. I list the exceptions though. They're in the book. I'm not hiding them somewhere. The first evidence of this notion that the Book of Mormon was an archaic text for its time was discovered by Rene Bangeter a research assistant of mine doing work for her master's thesis at BYU in, in 1998. I sat on it for five years because it's a little upsetting. Uh, but additional evidence convinced me that I should start really looking for it seriously, which I began to do in uh, 2003. And with the assistance of Carmack, we have discovered considerable evidence Virtually all the evidence of the text is that it's in early modern English. Uh, the initial chapters in the nature of the original language, uh, we list uh, 39 archaic lexical items that uh, died out at least 100 years before Joseph Smith translated, such as flatter, meaning to coax or entice, or that they might flatter them out of their stronghold is the way the text reads, even today. 25 archaic phrases are listed, such as but if, meaning unless. But if he yielded to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, King Benjamin's address. But um, Brother Talmadge changed it, so you don't see it. 34 archaic expressions, which are no, were, were already gone from English. In Joseph Smith's time, as far as we can tell, so many brave men which do now at this time stand in their arms, stand in their arms. Thirteen archaic grammatical forms to act according to their wills and pleasures, in the plural. And four syntactic constructions, uh, particularly the complex complements like, I will cause it that it shall soon overtake you, a very 
uh, archaic construction and um, not in the King James Bible. Colleagues have sent us dozens of supposed counterexamples. Um, I received one from one of my colleagues, 30 of them that he could not find on the internet. Um, it took Stan Carmack and I two hours to find them all in early modern English. Um, you just have to know how to look. The th another important finding is that the themes of the Book of Mormon are issues of the Protestant Reformation, the same time period, not from Joseph Smith's time, contrary to what historians have been trying to claim for a long time. Uh, so part five is coming out, the King James Bible and the Book of Mormon, 424 pages. Um, here are some of the issues that I'm going to be dealing with. What counts as a quotation? How do you know you have a quotation versus something paraphrastic? It's not an easy question to answer. Um, we've come up with a solution. I think it works. You can read it. <laughs> Are the quotations actually from the King James Bible? You have to consider this as a possibility. It turns out they all are, except one. One of them's from the 1530s in the Bibles of that time period. Ships of the Sea, Coverdale, uh, the Thomas Matthew Bible, or the Great Bible. Take your pick. Joseph, you know, the Palmyra Library probably had a copy. <laughs> What edition of the King James Bible is being cited? So I examined quite a few copies, actual copies, and um, it's difficult to be precise. I know some people are claiming they know exactly which one. This is really fudging, in my opinion. But the date is after the 1670s, for sure. That is pretty clear. Uh, did Joseph Smith hand over a marked up Bible to Oliver Cowdery to put, to write down the text? We know this is not true. Uh, the misspellings that Oliver Cowdery writes in are the typical, all the typical spellings that he miswrites when Joseph dictates the text to him. He is not copying from an actual Bible. Um, how did Joseph Smith use the Book of Mormon in his new translation? There are some play he believed the Book of Mormon came from, uh, was, was the inspired version, so to speak, and so he had it copied from the 1830 edition in certain places right into the King James translation, not realizing there were all these errors in the 1830 edition. So they're in your, the inspired version. Well, we don't call it the inspired version anymore, do we? Um, are there any significant differences in all these biblical quotations that are really worth considering? There are. There's a whole chapter I give to it. Some of them are quite surprising. How many of the differences rely on the italics in the King James text? Boy, a lot of people get worked up over this. Well, only 23% of the changes involve italics. So you got over three-fourths of them have nothing to do with italics. So if you've got a theory of what Joseph Smith's doing, you've got to go beyond italics. There are some clear cases which look like they're connected with italics. I list them, so they're in the book. Otherwise, there's very little evidence of it. There's about six expressions that show it. The best example that italics is not being used is the Sermon on the Mount and how it gets changed in the Book of Mormon which is really quite, it's really very different. About what about anachronistic King James elements in the quotations? There are mistakes in the translation and they are put into the Book of Mormon. So instead of a girdle, a rent, it should really read instead of a belt, girdle means belt anyway, instead of a belt, a rope, not a rent or cultural translations, the King James Bible, culturally translated, because they didn't, they said, do men light a candle? They, and they put it on a candlestick. That isn't what the Greek says. Do they light a lamp? And do they put it on a lampstand? 
Now this is a problem for some people. They get really worked up about it. Um, I don't have a problem with it because the Book of Mormon is being connected to the period of early modern English and the Bible of the early modern English is the King James Bible and they're just going to use the King James Bible. And we just live with it. It's, I don't consider it a problem, but it is for some people. Um, the evidence that I have been finding is that the translation of the Book of Mormon is a cultural translation, that we may understand it, and that it's a creative one. So the translation process is introducing elements which are not on the plates, is my belief. Unless, of course, the Lord told Mormon, write bar here. You stand before the bar of God, because there is no bar of God in the ancient world. It's only, it's a medieval thing. Well, the other book, you'll, you'll want to get a copy of this. I think this is, you know. Part six, spellings in the manuscripts and editions. George Horton in 1983 wrote an Ensign article which has caused quite a lot of misunderstanding about, he made numerous claims about the spelling uh, during the time period and uh, many people quote them even today, like spelling had not been standardized when the 1830 edition was printed, or the 1830 edition used Oliver Cowdery's misspellings, or the 1837 edition corrected all that bad spelling. These are all false. They're, they're not even slightly false. They are totally false. Well, we have an cha introductory chapter for us to deal with this. It's sort of a shame when you get something like this and people want to repeat it all over. But the majority of part six is about analyses of non-standard spellings. We do consider these spellings. There are three types of scribal spellers. One is a fairly good speller, but his handwriting is very poor. This is scribe two on the printer's manuscript. And um, I will give evidence in part seven, which is in the series, that this scribe is Martin Harris. We don't have, we have some now actual samples of Martin Harris's writing from the 1820s, small sample. It matches. Uh, Martin Harris looks like he was back in favor a little bit. Oliver Cowdery is a second rate speller, but a very beautiful hand. But he is not the great school teacher that we somehow think. But it's interesting about Oliver, as he's copying, he learns how to spell. And we see it, like exceeding. He misspells it throughout the original manuscript. He gets, he's, got, he's going through the printer's manuscript, he's just copying it from the original. He's misspelling it, one E, E-X-C-E-D-I-N-G. Every time, misspells it. All of a sudden, in 3rd Nephi 12 and 12, in the printer's manuscript, he spells it correctly, and he spells it correctly all the way to the end. This happens several dozen times, where all of a sudden, Oliver learns how to spell a word. He is proofing against, he's proofing his work against the, the sheets. And the typesetter is doing it correctly, and he says, oh, I've been misspelling this. And he learns it. Now this is important because Oliver Cowdery is learning to become smart. And so he'll eventually be considered learned and, and he will be. He just doesn't continue to misspell the rest of his life. A lot of our early church leaders never learned how to spell. Okay, there are two other books that will come out. Next year and the following, transmission of the text from the manuscripts through the editions. Um, we'll consider Joseph Smith's dictation of the text, what the two manuscripts tell us about how Joseph Smith translated. We'll go through 20 significant editions of the Book of Mormon, the LDS and RLDS ones. Um, there'll be photographic representations of select pages according to size, so you can see which ones are this big and which ones are this big. And uh, there'll be an emphasis on the textual changes, the kind of editing 
they have undergone and formatting changes. Formatting changes make a real big difference in how you read a text. And um, we'll see that. And then there'll be a number of significant independent editions. Part 8 will be on Book of Mormon textual criticism. Um, one of the big issues that I'm interested in is conjectural emendations. Some people get mad at me because I make conjectural emendations. Well, there have been conjectural emendations made in the text right from the beginning. When Oliver's trying to copy something from the manuscripts, he doesn't, can't figure it out, so he makes a conjecture what he thinks it is. The current LDS text has about 650 conjectural emendations. The Yale text of the Book of Mormon, the one that's based on the critical text, has 350, so a lot fewer. Um, Another interesting thing is Book of Mormon translators. They have to translate things which for them seem like garbage sometimes. And so they make emendations. And one French translator in 1840 made 20 of my 130 30 emendations. So, you know, it makes me feel good. You know, it's, there's a light mind out there saying, oh, there's something wrong with this. And, and came up with 20 of them. We'll talk about previous critical text work in the Book of Mormon, and we'll talk about the history of this project. So I'm grateful for Dan for allowing me to present a little bit, and I'm grateful to the Hafens for allowing me to indulge a little. Thank you. Interpreter, as it currently exists, has three main focuses in the sense that it's uh, taking in money and dispersing funds to support. One is obviously the film that's been represented this evening. Another is our involvement with, we're not the only ones involved with the uh, critical text project, but we're happy to be involved with it. Uh, and then the rest of the function, the regular weekly publication and so on. So that's all represented more or less this evening. And uh, But now I'd like to turn the time over to Noel Reynolds to introduce uh, Elder and Sister Hafen. Good evening. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know some of you that I only knew as names on uh, emails and so forth, and, it's, uh, and to renew acquaintances, some of you that I haven't seen for years. My wife, Sydney, and I were freshmen at BYU in 1960. This, that is in the same uh, millennium. <laughs> uh, and so was Marie Karchner. And we, all the three of us met uh, in a variety of freshman honors classes. BYU was just launching a new honors program. Uh, I remember Marie quite well from that because she was the only person that got a higher score than I did in the English class that they offered us. <laughs> she doesn't remember that. I, I, do, I do, not that I care about grades, but... <laughs> Um, but at that time, Bruce Haven was already on his mission, and so he came back about the time I left, and uh, Bruce and I didn't meet as undergraduates that I can recall. It, uh, uh, but we have become friends over the years, and I thought I would just share some informal things with you, but I, uh, as I thought about it, I realized that a lot of you... Um, don't know the Hafens. And I think I would like to share with you the actual bio that they have prepared. It's a, a short and integrated bio. Uh, we live in the same ward, so we tend to see each other every Sunday, and, it, uh, and I don't want to take too much for granted here. But Bruce grew up in St. George, Utah, and served his mission in Germany, and they met after his mission at BYU, married in 1964. Uh, he re received his bachelor's degree from BYU and the uh, Juris Doctor degree from the University of Utah. And so after practicing law in Salt Lake City, he went to BYU as a member of the original faculty of BYU's law school. That's something we have in common. Uh, I was on that original faculty too as a, uh, uh, I was in the philosophy department and I was teaching one class, 
philosophy of law class. We didn't run across each other there either. Um, but he taught family law and constitutional law. And uh, Bruce actually prepared a couple of papers in family law that were very important uh, uh, for the church and also uh, signal papers in the field. He then served as president of BYU-Idaho from 1978 to 1985. So that's what, about seven years? Uh, so, And then uh, came to BYU again as dean of the law school and later served as provost uh, with Rex Lee. Right? Uh, and uh, was called in 1996 as a full-time general authority served in area presidencies in Australia, North America, and Europe. So the Havens have traveled, uh, serving in that area presidency function in the church. He uh, served also at church headquarters where he was an advisor to various of the committees, the priesthood department, the uh, general auxiliary presidencies, church history, uh, temple department, and became an emeritus general authority in uh, 2010. They were then called as president and matron of the uh, St. George Temple and served there uh, the standard three years. Uh, more recently, and this is a calling that not many of you will receive, uh, he served as chairman of the Utah LDS Corrections Committee. And the church is organized in the prisons uh, throughout Utah and, uh, and Bruce was. Um, in charge of that for a period of time. He is the author of several books on gospel topics. You've probably seen these. Uh, the biography of Elder Maxwell, uh, books on marriage, the temple, the atonement, including uh, the very popular books, The Broken Heart and Covenant Hearts. Marie, uh, throughout this period, has served as a homemaker and a teacher. Uh, she has a master's degree in English from BYU and has taught Shakespeare, freshman writing, and Book of Mormon at BYU-Idaho, the University of Utah, and BYU. She was also on the Young Women's General Board, the Board of Directors of the Desert News, and, uh, as previously mentioned, matron of the St. George Temple. And she has edited and co-authored books with her husband, including The Contrite Spirit, and most recently just released Faith is Not Blind. Uh, the Havens have seven children and 46 grandchildren. And I'm not going to try to introduce your topic. I'll let you do that. But uh, what a, I just should add that uh, uh, as we've observed the Havens over the decades, uh, it is so obvious that they are such an exemplary, dedicated, consecrated couple in their service to the church. Brothers and sisters, it's a great pleasure for us to be with you tonight. We have admired so many of you for so long. And tonight we've got a, we're trying to ride two horses. I think they, there's probably an event in rodeoing where you're riding two horses and the idea is to keep them together. Here are our two horses. Uh, we were originally asked to talk about faith is not blind but we realized that a, a fraction of you heard our presentation at fair just a couple of days ago. I guess we could do a pop quiz and see if any of it has stuck after that long. If it didn't, we know that's our problem, not yours. But we've also been encouraged, since many of you have heard it, to just do a, a, a very shortened version of that. And I think the advice was just tell some stories. And so we'll, we'll try to do that. Um, so, so Marie will start with our, the summary of our topic, Faith is Not Blind. And f for those who want to, to, to see, I guess this is the Monday morning football highlights version. Uh, looks like all, everybody catches the passes in the end zone, but if you want to see the version where they drop the passes, then uh, we have also done the more complete version of this uh, for a, a devotional at BYU Hawaii a couple of years ago. Earlier this year, a, a forum assembly at, at uh, BYU Idaho, and those are online. And so we will 
with, with that explanation, sort of zoom through the first part and then tell a couple of stories. Okay, we are very glad to be with you tonight. And as Bruce said, what we're going to do is you're going to feel like you've got the 2x twice as fast thing going here. So we'll try and give you a little bit of background on what we have been invited to talk to you about, which is this new little book called Faith is Not Blind. Uh, Bruce and I met in a religion class at BYU, which was called Your Religious Problems. We solved our main religious problem by meeting each other. Uh, the class format was that we would choose a religious issue or a problem or a challenge that we wanted to investigate, do some research on, and then we would present to the class what we had found, and then each of us, at the end of the class period, would write a response to the person who had presented. So we had maybe 30 or 35 responses to the challenge that we had presented. Now listen to these issues and see if they sound current. Some of them were church history issues. Some had to do with criticisms of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. Others were doctrinal questions. Some others, however, were just, how can I live this aspect or that aspect of the gospel better? So that uh, has helped us to see as the decades have gone on that the questions themselves are not new, but the internet is and that the internet has magnified both. It has helped to clarify in some ways, but has created chaos in others. But that class did help us to see that there is a natural tension between the ideal that we're all trying to reach and the reality of our lives, which often conflicts with our ideals. So, as you can see, I hope, am I standing right in the way of a lot of you? <laughs> yeah. Not missing much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how we can solve that. Although I could take this and stand over there. You're okay. You'd have to be a lot bigger to watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. Okay. So, with the real and the ideal, I think you can see that um, we all are aiming for the ideal, but the real, the realities of our lives, make it so that it's hard for us sometimes to reach those ideals. The realities are black and white. There's a little, just, well, let's, let's back up with that. Let's just call it level one. You really need to explain the gap. Yes, we will. We'll explain the gap. Before you talk but they can't see the gap yet. Before. Okay, um, we'll approach it that way. So, when we're young, we tend to see things idealistically. Black or white, little gray. We're typically idealistic, optimistic, loyal, teachable. I just remember everything I read I believed. I don't know if you were like that at 14 or 16. New converts are similar. But then you start to see some natural tension, as we mentioned, between the ideals of the gospel and the realities of life, between what is and what ought to be. Then you begin to see the gap, the distance between where we are and where we'd like to be. So here's what the gap looks like. Examples, very quickly. We see human limitations that we haven't seen before. Maybe it's our parents, maybe it's church leaders. Maybe our prayer goes unanswered for a long time. Maybe there's a health issue that we hadn't expected. Often these things are not what we had expected. Or we come across something on the internet that we just had not expected and it just kind of throws us. So the gap, though, stretches us because we're trying to reach beyond where we are but it can produce some confusion and some uncertainty. And you know that there are scriptures even that if we take just one for example, you've got justice and mercy and they seem to be contradictory or at least how can you balance them until you take them together with the atonement. 
So life is full of uncertainty and learning to manage the gap is a big part of why we're here on Earth. So Lehi's dream is also a good illustration of the fact that there is ambiguity and uh, sometimes difficulty with trying to manage even the scriptures. We've got the iron rod in Lehi's vision, but we also have the mists of darkness. So uh, managing that gap is what we're talking about tonight. Only a few years ago, we ran across this statement from Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great judge, which gave us a nice framework for trying to say what we were seeking to say. This looks complicated, but it isn't, and that's part of the point. Holmes said, I wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So out of this, we find three stages. Stage one, the simplicity before complexity, innocent and untested. Complexity, the gap. Things are hard. They don't make sense. Uh, we fall short of reality. Uh, contradictions. But if we can make our way through that, we get to the simplicity beyond complexity. The little example that captures this for us is the woman in the Utah State Prison on testimony meeting day with other women inmates who said, when I was a little girl, I used to love to bear my testimony. I would run up in front of everybody and I would say, I love my mom and dad. Heavenly Father loves me. The gospel's true. Jesus suffered for my sins. And now, all these years later, here I am with you behind bars, trying to tell you what's on my heart. What have I been learning in the last few years? She was choosing to come to church. And what did she have to say? She said, here's how I feel today. Heavenly Father loves me. The gospel is true. Jesus suffered for my sins. And now I know what all of that means. That's our little example for the three stages. And because we're accelerating, we'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, some, there are challenges that we talk about in the longer version. Some people kind of get stuck in, the, in stage one, the simplicity before complexity, such as those, as the psychologists say, who are in denial about reality. And until we can see both reality and the ideal, we can't really solve our problems. On the other hand, there are those who get stuck in stage two, where they where the, the skepticism they learn in higher education, for example, becomes not just a useful tool, but a way of life. So they're skeptical about everything, and they like popping the bubbles of those who they see stuck in stage one. So it's best if we can do both, and then move to the simplicity beyond complexity. And I'll, I'll let Marie do that. Now, uh, this is the fast version, so we're leaving out quite a few things. I think you can. Really, really have to move. Yeah, I think you can see that. It's not a blind. It's not a blind obedience, but it's a trusting obedience. It's a wise and informed obedience and faith, one that chooses to believe. Let me just give you one little example that shows someone who went all the way through all those three stages. This was a young woman that uh, we know grew up in a Mormon home, uh, fast track through young women's program. Her young womanhood's medall young womanhood medallion at age 14. When she got to be 18, somebody suggested to her uh, the idea that women ought to hold the priesthood, and she got so invested in that idea and so convinced by it that she decided to pull her membership out of the church. She went to college after that, and a couple of years later, her roommate wanted to hear the lessons, so. Holly sat in, the missionaries challenged them to pray. She decided that she would pray, but the second that she said, Heavenly Father, then her heart started to melt, and she developed what she called the closeness with her Heavenly Father, a tender relationship with Him. And a little bit later, someone asked her, what about that issue that you had earlier? And she said, you know, that has not been such an issue now that I think about it. She said, I have a relationship with him. I trust him. He knows what he's doing. So you can see how she had gone from that innocence into the complexity, but then into the innocence, excuse me, 
the simplicity beyond complexity. We could apply these principles to all kinds of areas of life, growing, learning, uh, of all kinds. But for our purpose, we've tried to focus on applying these ideas to the current issue of criticisms of the church. And the story we'd share here just briefly is about a friend, someone we've known for a number of years. We call him Matthias. He is, uh, grew up outside the U.S., but in, a, in an LDS home. He went on a mission, returned, was married in the temple. Uh, they had several children, and when he was in a local leadership position, he began getting questions about issues he didn't know how to answer. And some of the people who came with their questions told him that uh, they had run across these things on the internet. So uh, he said, when he later was talking publicly about how this had all uprooted his faith, he said, I, I had never heard before that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. I didn't really understand anything about the, just the race and the priesthood issue. And I didn't know anything about how Joseph had translated anything. And I, he felt like the church hadn't told him these things. We know others in his family who said, well, the church told us. We don't, we don't know why that was new to you. And as Marie said, we ran across these things so many years ago in a BYU class. But his case does illustrate the problem that in the day of the international church and the internet, We've got to do a better job of teaching the advanced curriculum. There are good reasons why we haven't. As we've observed the church over a couple of generations, it's been essential in the international growth of the church that we provide material that is simplified, accessible. People of all languages and cultures, many who are new in the church, can access it. But uh, in more recent times, I think the church is realizing how to deal with the need for a more complete version for those who are ready for it. And so these are some examples. You would have heard about all of them. I don't need to say more than just show the slide. The Encyclopedia of Mormonism it has been around since the early 90s, but we're surprised at how few people seem to know about it, even though it's available in other languages. Saints is uh, also very accessible, and we are finding out, Steve, that many people love saints and are reading it. So we're grateful to the Church History Department. The Gospel Topics Essays would be the other example. What about all the things that Ferris doing? Well, and there are so many, yeah, Marie said, what about all the things FAIR is doing? That's exactly right. We're so thankful for what FAIR does. And, and there are others who are trying to help in the same ways. Uh, and, and doing what you do to have things available in the, in the world of social media is especially important. Okay, the last thing we do, I don't think we'll take time to do this other than to list them. Uh, we offer four suggestions for dealing with these issues in the internet age. Uh, Marie, do you want to say one word about each? Why don't you just, I think they could ask if they had a specific question. Okay. Uh, well, you can, you can see what they are. Uh, is it okay to ask questions in the church? Answer, yes. Uh, should we be cautious about the Internet's weaknesses? I think you all know the answer to that. In fact, you could all stand up and probably talk about these subjects. Uh, and, and, and the one on focus, I, I'll just give you this one. This was in Noel's honor because he's from Wyoming. Our example on focus on the restoration's positive content is the golf course at the foot of the Grand Tetons, where imagine a golfer who's there golfing, but he spends all his time looking for balls, lost golf balls in the rough, instead of looking at the magnificent mountains. That's our analogy, the mountains of doctrine that Joseph gave us. Let, let's, let's appreciate that and not just get lost in the rough looking for those loft balls. And then meekness, uh, our only comment on that is from Elder Maxwell. I mean, I'll, I, that's one, I'll, I'll spare you everything else that's there, but, but would quote this from him. Doubt can, <coughs> doubt can either strengthen or weaken faith depending on our supply of meekness. We've got some examples for that. You can imagine what they'd be. See this? It really is the Monday morning highlights version. And we're even saying this was the pattern of Adam and Eve. The garden is stage one. The going into the lone and dreary world is stage two. Talk about <coughs> complexity. And then finally the angel comes to teach them what's really going on here with this ordinance they don't understand. Once they get that, Eve said, we read of Eve, Eve heard all these things and was glad, were it not for our transgression. We never should have known the joy of our redemption and the eternal life God giveth to all the obedient. So it's that fundamental. Then, uh, our, uh, some of our children and their friends have pointed out to us that 
we have this problem, uh, Marie and I are at the stage, this wouldn't be true of any of you, of course, once we've said the word social media, we've exhausted our knowledge of the subject. <laughs> but, but our younger generations tell us, if you really want to be of any help to those who are younger, they're not going to go into Deseret Book and read books. They're out there on, online talking to each other. And so they've encouraged uh, and have now created just within the last couple of weeks. So you can, those of you who would be interested, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a website, faithisnotblind.org. And there is a, a Facebook group. And there are podcasts on the website. I don't think we'll have time to go into that now, but... Uh, but you could tell them what the podcasts are. Yeah. So now we'll transition to telling a couple of stories because I want to tell you about one of the people who's become a key figure in the podcast effort. He's our videographer. He is from England. His name is Christian Malam. He has a wonderful wife named Elizabeth. They're probably about 40 and they moved to BYU, Idaho just a couple of years ago to take a job in the communications department to teach film and video and social media. He's a counselor to our son-in-law in a bishopric at BYU, Idaho. These two, they've become close friends. And as they've talked about this project and have gotten into it, they're the ones who are saying to us, here's what we need to do. Well, with uh, so Chris is doing the video for all these podcasts and he's just excellent at it. So that's my transition to wanting to tell you this story and it will bring me to, to, to a, a, just a concluding comment. Uh, we first met Chris Malam, our videographer, when he was in the hospital at the University of Utah. He had, he had a number of issues. He, it, it, they weren't at all sure that they would, he'd be able to keep his leg. Then they weren't even sure that he was going to live. He went through some really hard experiences. Our daughter and her husband, who knew him so closely, told us how hard this was, invited us to come to the hospital and help give a blessing, which we did. Chris is okay now. He's got some longer term issues to deal with, but he's functioning well. And uh, when we first met him, there in the hospital room, and they wanted us to they were sort of, who do, who do you know from so-and-so? Uh, I guess it was our daughter who said, Chris, tell them how you're one of Neil Maxwell's boys. And I laughed, wondering how Chris could be one of Neil Maxwell's boys. And he told us the story of uh, that years ago in his stake in England, Elder Maxwell had been the state conference visitor. And as he told the story, uh, the, the adolescent children of most of the stake leaders who were, weren't in the meetings. They were out trying to figure out the world. They'd wandered, they'd wandered away. And then they kind of got choked up as they told us that in the closing meeting of that state conference, Elder Maxwell left a blessing. And the blessing had touched the people so much that uh, they had a new sense of peace and purpose about what was going on. And, and then Chris told the story, he's, and he, there's a podcast. He's, he's one of the podcasts, if you want to find him. He'll tell you the story of how not long after that happened, he didn't know about the state conference. He didn't know about any blessing. He was out with his mates, living it up. <laughs> but one night, as he tells the story in his podcast, he says that he realized all oh, this was going nowhere. He had to change, and he spent most of the night praying. And the next morning, had a whole, his, his biggest concern was, how am I going to tell my mates I'm all through with this? He went to the bishop. He changed his life, went on a mission, came home. Well, about three weeks ago, we won't go into the details, but we were in England, and we were in the stake where all that had happened with Chris. Chris and his wife, Elizabeth, had gone back. First time they'd taken their children back in the three or four years since they'd been here. And we kind of teamed up for reasons I won't go into, but it's partly because he's helping with the videography. As we were in their the room for sacrament meeting, uh, and then in the time that followed, uh, the current state president heard me say something about Neil Maxwell. And he leaned over to me and he said, do you realize how beloved the name of Neil Maxwell is to the people in this stake. I said, oh, I've heard something about that. And so when they asked me to say something, I said some things about, you would know from 
what Dan said in the introduction, we had the blessing of come to, coming to know Elder and Sister Maxwell unusually well, and I talked about that a little bit. At the end of the meeting, the number of people who came and wanted to tell us their version of what had happened and what it meant just kind of blew us over. We had three different people come and bring us a copy of the blessing. <laughs> he hadn't written it. I don't know that he ever saw this. And when I was writing his biography, I didn't know about this story at all. I would have loved it. And so this is the, my first opportunity to tell you publicly what Neil Maxwell said in that blessing. And the reason I tell it here partly because it's just a wonderful story. And how does it relate to our project? Well, our videographer was blessed by it. But also, what Elder Maxwell has to say here is a beautiful way of capturing that uh, no matter what we do in our efforts to get into the social media or the academic world or whatever we do from the 40 and 50,000 foot level that makes so much difference over time, actually, it all comes down to what happens in individual lives and in individual homes. And our, our little amateurish approach in our project is designed to reach individuals. So our podcasts are not with experts, they're just with people who have gone through the process, as Marie described, of going through all three stages. We're trying to find people like that and interview them and they tell their stories briefly and their stories are like Chris Malm's. Let me just read for you, in conclusion, what Elder Maxwell said. Imagine at the end of a state conference in a little stake in England in 1990, with stake and ward leaders distraught because many of their children, their own children, were rebelling and carrying on. <laughs> he said, Here, I'll just read you what this is what one of the members of that state gave us when we were there. This is the paper he gave us, it's A4 paper. <laughs> Following Elder Maxwell's remarks on the Savior, he said, quote, because of the reverence shown by the congregation and the spirit that is present, I feel impressed to leave you an apostolic blessing. As with all blessings, its fulfillment is contingent upon your faithfulness. I bless you that from this day forward, the faithful of this stake will feel a depth of appreciation and understanding of the atonement and that you will personally sense the love which the Savior has for each of you, even in the midst of your deepest anguish. I bless you within your marriages and families that there will be greater feelings of love for each other and that your children will feel this love and will taste the sweetness of an LDS home and that in comparison the things of the world will taste sour to them. Some family members may stray, but I bless you that this will only be for a season and that they will be drawn back by a remembrance of that sweetness and love to return home to the fold. I bless you with a quickening of your desires to read and search the scriptures with a thirst never to be quenched. I bless you that in years to come, whenever you hear the choir's hymn, Be Still My Soul, your feelings will bring to your remembrance this blessing and the feelings of this moment. I bless you with the courage to develop the virtues of the Father and the Son in love and with a growing sense that you are about your Father's business. When you feel your inadequacies and imperfections, instead of being disabled by your problems, you will be spurred to overcome. May you so live that by faithfulness you will be prepared to see the face of the Father with pleasure and at the, at the judgment bar. This blessing I bestow upon you as a friend and a brother, but most importantly, by virtue of the call, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and do it in Jesus' name, amen. So he could have just stood up and said, I bless you that your kids will come back. No, he blessed us, and I think that's for all of us. It begins with the atonement. And then that fills our hearts and our homes with love. And our children feel something. And when they're wandering, tasting the things of the world, like Enos in the forest, they'll remember the sweetness. And it's better than the sour they've been tasting. 
and they'll come home and they'll learn to love the scriptures with a thirst that can't be quenched. I think that's what interpreter is all about. It's what all of us are all about. I know the Lord is in what you're doing. I'm so grateful for that. May he bless all of you. May he bless all of us in a church that's trying to cope with a, a world that's increasingly sour. I know he lives and loves us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Now Maria is going to teach us a closing song that's part of one last story. I think you have, there should be one copy. Can I see if anyone cannot see a copy? Have you got enough that you can see a copy? Got one or two here. I think when you hear this melody and we sing a couple of the verses, you will feel almost like you have al always known this song. It's a favorite in the Swedish hymn book. Uh, we heard it when we were on an assignment in a Swedish state conference. Our translator, um, we, we said, we love this song. Where did it come from? Can you translate it? She said, it's poetry. It'll take me some time. But a few months later, we received it in the mail. As you can see on the second page, it was written by um, Lena Sandalberg and translated by our translator, Jennifer Oosterud. Lena Sandalberg was a, a Christian woman of the 19th century, deep faith, and a, an extraordinary love for her father. She was a single woman, and then the tragedy that hit when she and her father were crossing a lake on a boat, and he was washed overboard in a storm, and they couldn't save him, and she had to overcome the devastation that that caused in her life. And she reached into her faith and started to write these hymns, these, this, these poems of faith. This is just one of them. There are others. And a guitarist whose name was Oscar Onfeld was the one who wrote some of the melodies that these tunes um, are, can be sung to. So thank you to Kent Flack, who is playing the organ. Um, so with the first verse, you can see that, and we will also put the words on the um, screen behind me so that you can, yes, if, you play, if he plays the, the first verse, then I will just say the words so that you can see how the words kind of fit to the music, and then we'll sing it through. So let me live in moment after moment. Let me truly trust Thee day by day. Let me not forget Thou art my Father. Let me live by every word Thou sayest. And then notice the swelling in this part of the song. Every trial Thou hast for me constructed and hast given me the strength I need. Even when I cannot see tomorrow, may I pay thy counsel every heed. Okay. Let's let's sing that first verse again. Give you a chance to again to feel the, the melody of that.
And then notice the words in the second verse and how it fits this general overall theme of simplicity, complexity, and then uh, uh, I, I have too many words to call that second, but the simplicity beyond complexity. A uh, trust. Um, and maybe this is the place to just insert this little footnote because Jennifer Oosterud, our translator, said of Lena Sandelberg that her faith was based on trust and not on blessings. And therefore, she could withstand any trial. So notice those words in the second verse as we sing it. Okay. see that second verse is kind of concentrating on our developing our spiritual strength and deepening our core. And then notice the third verse then is saying, after we have developed our core, then what do we do? We reach out to try and help others. So I'm going to be your primary chorister for just a second here and ask you all to kind of sit up and take a deep breath, because I can tell you've got really good voices. And if it's okay with you, Kent, we'll pick up the pace just a little bit. Okay. So day by day, I feel my spirit strengthen. Okay. Day by day, I feel my spirit strengthen so that I can help my fellow man. Let me Thank you so much. The Tabernacle Choir better watch out. <laughs> I'd like to hang, uh, thank Brother and Sister Hafen for, uh, for speaking to us and sharing that with us. And uh, my wife and I were trying to think of something we could give them, and uh, we found this book. It's a book that uh, David J. Larson and Jeffrey Bradshaw, who's our, our, one of our absentee vice presidents who's serving a mission in the Congo, is second in two years, I think, or three years, uh, with his wife. Uh, they put this together called In God's Image and Likeness, Enoch Noah and the Tower of Babel. It's uh, published by the Interpretive Foundation. We'll have to give you a copy of this. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone for coming. Um, we appreciate all that you do and, uh, and all that you have given and all that you've done to help, not only Interpreter, but the kingdom generally, and, uh, and we're grateful for that. This is a tremendous cause to be involved in. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite some of you, if at the end, some of us have a little meeting at the end of this, but uh, if you wouldn't mind, if a few of you would like to stick around, help put away chairs. That would be really helpful. I'm sure for most of you this will be a first. I don't think Latter-day Saints have much experience with, uh, with putting out chairs and putting away chairs, uh, but you might enjoy doing it for a change. 
Um, so anyway, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We're grateful you were able to come. And is Deidre still here? Yes. If you'd be willing to come forward and offer a benediction, we'd appreciate it. Deidre is one of our volunteers who's been supervising uh, peer review for us. Uh, she also serves as a judge, which is intimidating. No, 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 don't worry about that.